Hello, you most likely clicked on this video because you want to learn coding and grow a job from it. But really, anyone can and should learn programming, even just the very basics. The future is evolving technology further and further each year and whether you're an engineer, architect, paramedic, pilot, teacher or any other job or any age, these jobs will, if not already, benefit from knowing coding, from creating your own website designs without paying a fortune, writing programs and algorithms to speed up and enhance your workflow, knowing what annoying error messages mean and how to fix them, and of course, any age anyone can learn. And if you do want to have a career in ICT and create interactive and responsive websites, or develop amazing games, or advance in cybersecurity and defend against hackers, then this video is the best way to start your world of coding. This video is a theory lesson for anyone wanting to learn coding from a complete scratch and we'll cover what code actually is, binary code, different coding languages, major elements using coding like variables and logic gates, and some final tips on becoming a program. Excited? And let's begin with a simple question. What is code? Let's take a simple definition from the web. Code is a set of instructions or a system of rules. That definition feels too mechanical, which yes, code is run mechanically, but it's not written mechanically. Even AI written code is still human's thoughts. They wrote the AI's code. There isn't and never will be a true AI. Every idea comes from the programmer, it's written by an actual person. So let's change our definition. Code is a set of human written instructions or a system of human defined rules. Essentially, code is just a list of instructions. These instructions are like a method for baking a cake, just being more restricted in how you write them, the steps being more drawn out. For example, instead of measure 130 grams of milk and mix it in a medium bowl, you will need to break it into lots of steps, like open the drawer, pick up a medium sized bowl, close the drawer, place the medium sized bowl on the bench, open the fridge, pick up the milk, close the fridge, and you might need to break it down even more since the computer probably doesn't know what fridge or milk is so you would have to write code to tell it. And computers can't just read code. They need a solution that's affordable, can be mass produced, and is reliable. And that solution is binary code. Computers need a way to store data in every single aspect, not just hard drives, but processors, graphics cards, RAM, and other components need to store data to then process it. For example, let's say that you open Google Chrome and perform a search. Your computer needs to have a way to store that search so that your tab will stay open and the search can be sent to Google to get the search results. But how can computers store data? They can't exactly read and write from a piece of paper. So how about switches? Switches can have two different outcomes, on or off, true or false, on or zero, which is binary code. Zeros and ones, each number corresponding to a different switch. Each number is known as a bit, except computers don't use normal switches but a special type called transistors, which have the concept of switches, but are completely different. A transistor has two electrical inputs and one output. If a current flows through the first input, then it'll come out via the output, giving a zero or a one. However, if the second input is powered, then electricity will never come out of the output, sorting it a zero. Transistors can be made incredibly tiny, and in fact an iPhone 14 has around 15.8 billion transistors, and a 1 terabyte drive could have over 16 trillion, because it also needs extra transistors for processing. But 16 trillion is a lot of transistors no matter what. So is there a solution for this? Some hard drives use something called QLC flash, which means that every transistor can store 8 bits or numbers, which takes the hard drive down to 2 trillion. You might be wondering how on earth a transistor can store 8 bits, but electronics can get really in depth and advanced very quickly, so we won't go into that. Anyway, imagine being a developer and having a huge project to code, but only being able to write in zeros and ones. You will need to memorize every translation and it will be extremely hard to debug and actually read your code. That's why there are coding languages, which are very similar to actual languages being that they translate lines of code, such as 7 plus 2, into zeros and ones. This means that anyone can write a lot easier and be able to read their code. But there isn't just one language, but thousands. So, the best way to learn coding is to first learn the basics of coding from this video and series, then choose what languages you want to learn from there. We'll go over different languages in a later video. By the way, if you're enjoying so far, please consider subscribing and liking the video. 
helps me out so much. Anyway, let's check out the coding elements. And one of the main elements in coding is variables. Put simply, a variable is something that contains any value, which could be a number, some text, which is referred to as a string, or even a whole list of items. For example, a variable can hold a play speed in the game, some quiz answers, or a to-do list. A variable's value can be changed at any time in your code. Variables can also store arrays. An array looks a bit like this, where each cell holds a value, like a variable. Both dimensions, number of cells and columns, can be infinite or even just one or two wide. This is called a two-dimensional array, or 2D array. You can use two numbers to find a location of a cell. Arrays can get much more complicated, as each cell can hold its own array. A nested array looks like this, and it changes the name to a 3D array. Here's a way to visualize it. You use three numbers this time to find a cell. 4D arrays exist too. Imagine an infinite number of these infinite cubes and how many cubes there is is the extra number in finding one of those cells. Any level array exists, even a 135D array. Next, let's look at if conditions. These conditions check whether or not something is true, like 0 plus 2 equals 1. If it is true, then the code in the top will run, which is surrounded by these, parentheses. There can also be an else condition added to this, which runs if the statement is false. You can also have an else if, which runs if the first condition is false and any other else ifs above it are false, but its statement is true. You're probably not going to have a hard coded value like 0 plus 2 equals 1, but as a developer you already know if it's true or false. It would be more effective to use a variable in the condition such as this. You also don't need to test if a value is equal to another since you can use other signs like greater than or less than. You can also use logic gates. A common logic gate is OR, which returns true if at least one of two conditions is true. An example of this might be checking if a user is the owner or has permission to an item in a bank. The next is the AND gate, which returns true if both conditions are true. This is useful for if a play in a game meets two conditions, like their money and diamonds are both at least 500. The final simple logic gate is NOT. It returns true if the condition is false and vice versa. There are many other logic gates such as the exclusive OR or ZOR gate, but we won't go over them yet. You can use multiple logic gates like something and something or something. The problem with this is that you can interpret it two ways. The first is something and something needs to be true or something needs to be true. The second way is something needs to be true and either something or something needs to be true. A little bit confusing. But how does a computer know which one to do, especially if you have lots of logic gates with hundreds of interpretations? Programmers generally use brackets like this to separate the gates. Simple. The innermost bracket statements are performed first, then it keeps going out. And those are just the elements we'll cover today. Later videos will be more interactive so you can follow along at your own pace. One last thing, if you didn't fully understand the elements, that's perfectly fine. We will cover everything again in more detail in later videos. If you're really feeling stuck, try watching the video again. Here are some final tips for coding to finish off the video. Tip 1. You won't know everything. There are so many languages and so many ways to code that maybe some people might know more than you, but don't be put off by that. By practicing, you can get better and better. Tip 2. Focus on the languages you want to learn. Since there are thousands of coding languages, you should focus on no more than three, at least at a time. It takes a long time to start remembering everything in that language. Tip number three, never copy code. Don't steal someone's code. If you like something I made, go ahead, try and replicate it, or even ask for permission to use it, but never copy. Use other people's code as inspiration, you're not alone on the coding journey. Tip number four, if something turns out wrong, don't worry. You might not be able to make what you originally planned for. Use coding forums to ask for help, search Google for help, get documentation on websites like w3schools or developer.mozilla.org, put that product on hold for now, or just be proud of how far you got. Tip number five, take regular breaks. It will help rethinking ideas. Get some fresh air, and when you come back, you'll have a fresh mindset. Thank you for watching this video, if you enjoyed it, please consider subscribing if you're not already, it supports me more than you could ever imagine, and also go ahead and like the video. Thanks once more, and I'll see you in the next one.